Well, switching gears now as we continue to talk auto show on location, we're on the shop floor here at Laval International. It used to be called Laval Tool and Mold. It was founded in 1975 by Larry as a part. In 2018, this year, it operates as Laval International. It continues to be family owned and is one of the leading compression mold makers here in North America. So the big question I had as we set up this live broadcast is what exactly do they make? How does the process happen? What does the auto show mean for the workers here on the floor? I got a chance to take a tour of the shop. Take a listen. We design and build uh, plastic injection and mainly compression molds. And uh, behind us is uh, production. Uh, we are cutting and handworking and spotting and fitting and assembling right behind me here. So can you show me some of the new equipment? Sure, right this way. You lead the way, sir. <laughs> Those designs then are sent to the shop floor um, where you need to put them into the steel. And to do that, uh, these fellows behind me here on the machines here, uh, they'll take that data, they'll put a cutter path over it, and they're basically teaching the machine how to cut that surface and how to put it into steel. Now there are several operations within the cutting and machining of a, of a mold, right? There's obviously uh, some 3D operations that have to be done, but there's a lot of 2D. There's a lot of holes, a lot of cooling channels that have to be drilled. And this is an example of this, of that. Uh, arms, you might get a little wet here, so be careful. Some of these steels, depending on the part, will need finishes uh, better than that of a mirror. Uh, they really do. Uh, so I'll show you some examples of that. Well, this is, this is a prototype project, and uh, the surface finish uh, needs to be good. So these guys are actually uh, hand polishing and buffing to get the surface finish required. And you can tell even for a prototype, this is, uh, this is rather, rather good here. Uh, I personally used to love the auto show because it was an opportunity to go there and actually look back and, and see the fruits of your labor, so to speak. Uh, you could see uh, projects that you worked on and, and identify with them a little bit. This is what we do at Laval. Jenner goes on to say that Laval services many customers, ranging from military and government applications to household products, recreation vehicles, heavy trucks, and specialty vehicles, in addition to the automotive sector. Joining me here on the shop floor is Jonathan Azapardi, president of Laval International. There is a lot that I want to talk to you about. Thanks for hosting us. Thanks, Arms. How are you? I am very well. Thank you so much for taking the time for us to be here. But uh, I think now is a good place to start to get your reactions to comments made yesterday at the auto show by automotive advisor to the Canadian government, Ray Tenge, about how he thinks the auto sector, Jonathan, should be innovating faster. So t take a listen to this. And if you think of the car industry today, does it meet the customer's expectations? If so, why people that are l driving luxury vehicles have their smartphone with uh, the Google Maps on, on their, uh, beside them? Because most cases, it's better than, than the technology that's in the car. So the car industries, if we're going to try to meet the customer's expectation, in my opinion, need to learn about speed. Yeah, cars can go fast, but management has to be faster. So Tenge's reaction there. What's your reaction to that comment that the Canadian automotive sector isn't as innovative as it should be? Well, I'd like to start by saying I really respect everything that Ray's done. He's done a, a tremendous job of representing the automotive industry, and him and I spoke about this same topic many times. He actually spoke at one of our events just recently, and uh, I agree with what he's saying, uh, but only half of what he's saying. Uh, I would say that for sure the automotive industry has relied on its competitive advantage by using the exchange rate and because of that they haven't been as innovative as their partners to the south or the partners across the ocean. Uh, so I do agree with them half. Uh, the other half that I don't agree with them is the tier twos. That's where we live. That's what our industry is. That's what mold makers are. And actually where you stand right now is going to be where one of our brand new machines are going to be dropping in which we should be taking in the, by the end of the month. So I think there's a little bit, uh, it's a little unfair to compare the entire industry to with, uh, you know, one comment like that. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, we do have lots of room to grow. Jonathan, speaking of comments, when we took a tour of the shop floor uh, last week to prepare for tonight's broadcast, you and I were talking about the shadow looming of NAFTA and the ongoing discussion of NAFTA affecting business, specifically your business. What are you hearing from your colleagues in North America, specifically the United States and in Mexico, about the feeling of if NAFTA goes south? Uh, I think everybody's staying pretty quiet right now. Uh, they don't want to be a target. 
Uh, but I can say the sentiment that's uh, not going on record is everybody is strategizing what it's going to look like after NAFTA. And that's kind of telling me that everybody's real nervous and real anxious to see what's going to happen. So I think what you're seeing right now in the United States with the repositioning of a lot of the, uh, the major truck lines and a lot of the major vehicles, uh, the uh, tier ones that are positioning themselves and moving themselves into to, uh, geographical locations close to these plants is telling you that everybody's starting to prepare and strategize as what it's going to look like if NAFTA does dissolve. So let's talk about content regulation. How does that affect what you do here at Laval? Well, I think what you have to understand is that from the automotive industry, uh, whether you're heavily in the automotive industry or not, our community relies on it. About 80% of everybody who works in this community will be affected one way, shape, or form uh, how that border is treated. Uh, for the industry itself, we go in five-year cycles. So it's very important that you understand that what's happening today is making is has an effect on the decisions that are going to be for the next five years. So if NAFTA starts to fall by its wayside or starts to be dissolved, the people that are making those decisions are going to take into consideration that there's uncertainty. Very strong sentiment that uncertainty could change their decision on where they're going to place new work. And finally here, Jonathan, you know, 40 years, this business is in your blood. It's in part of your family. I mean, it's a family atmosphere, 60 employees. What does the auto show mean to you folks here? Uh, the auto industry is very important that it stays in Detroit for one, because this is the automotive capital of, I would like to say, the world. So what happens here shows a lot of what's going to happen in the next two to five years. So for us, when we go out to the auto show, we're looking at the new vehicles. We're looking at basically a grocery list, a Christmas list, if you would say, for what we're looking at in the future and how it's going to come and land in Windsor, uh, especially for the mold makers. We have a lot to say and a lot to do with what goes in those cars. So we want to make sure that we're up and coming and knowing what's going on. And the auto show being right here in our backyard is just such a compliment to our uh, community. A pleasure to have us here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. No, no, it's all our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's Jonathan Esapardi, who is the president here at Laval International.